Hello, how are you now? I'm now in Birmingham. I just want to share with you really something really quick. Like in, in this hotel here, uh, do a quick shot for you. I just finished delivering another NEC free course to another client here in Birmingham. And during the delivery, I've got one very common question. That is how to get a pass. Therefore, this time around, let's talk something different. Instead of going to the technicality of the, of, the, of the NEC contract, let's talk about assessment. And obviously, many of us here will be quite concerned about that. Now, there are different types of assessment, NEC 3 assessment, NEC 4 assessment. Let's talk about the NEC 3 type this time wrong, even though this channel is mainly devoted to NEC 4. But many of the big projects outside, they are still using NEC 3. And in NEC 3, Project Manager Accreditation Assessment, apart from multiple choice questions, you need to write up something. And when we write up something, we sort of expose ourselves. Which is, which is, which is the challenge here. Apart from, apart from the obvious facts that you need to understand the contract, what else? What else? What are the common pitfalls in the assessment that you should not fall into and how to get a pass. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about three common pitfalls in NEC3 short essay assessment. Let's go for it. All right. Once again, you need to understand the contract first. If you do not understand when to notify compensation events, if you mix up plans completion and completion date, if you do not understand what do you mean by what do you mean by employer's risk in NEC3? Now NEC4 they call it client's liabilities. In NEC3, we call that employer's risk. Then don't go for it. If you go for it, you're not going to make it. Because all these fund fundamental concepts you need to make sure you understand before you even write something. Now I'm not talking about those. Apart from those, apart from those. Any other things that I need to be careful of? Number one, number one, some answers, some answers may surprise you. Number one, the use of capitalized terms and italics. Sometimes people will think, oh wow, all these formatting issues, why, why, does, it, why does it even matter? It matters. It matters. Just imagine yourself being a client reading from uh, some NEC consultant and they call themselves NEC consultant and they cannot even follow the basic rules in the contract. Will you trust them? Obviously not. And therefore, for defined terms, when you write up something, make sure you put a capitalized term in. If you're talking about identified terms, for example, completion date, for example, project manager, simple things. For example, employer in NEC3, okay, NEC3, we call them employer, not the client. Use italics, use italics. It matters, it matters. Words matter in NEC. Words matter in contract. And therefore, we are looking at the right format, trying to, trying to demonstrate ourselves to the examiner that we really understand the contract. So that is number one. Number one. You may think it's a, a small things. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. So number one. Number one. The choice of the use of capitalized terms and italics terms, which means defined term and identified term. Number two now. Number two. Do you raise an early warning? No, you don't raise an early warning. You notify an early warning. Do you claim a compensation event? You don't claim a compensation event. You notify a compensation event. What am I talking about here? Number two, number two, when you write things up, even though we may understand what you mean, but the choice of verbs, V-E-R-B, okay? The choice of verbs. It is important in the contract. Why? Because in the contract, there are different forms of communication. And there are different uh, communication which bear some specific meaning in there under NEC. For example, notification. Notification has to be done separately. Therefore, one defect, one notification, one early warning, one, one notification, one compensation event, one notification. You notify compensation event. You don't raise an early warning. You notify an early warning. Why? Because if you notify an early warning, then you need to do that separately. 
to make it effective under the contract. And that is important. And by the way, by the way, why do we not say we claim a compensation event? Why? How do you know it's a claim until you have implemented it? How do you know it's a claim until you have assessed it? Sometimes some compensation events may turn out to have a very small effects or sometimes some compensation events may have some negative effects. For example, omission of works. Omission of works. And therefore, in NEC, we do not claim a compensation event. And by reading your writing, the examiner will understand what you understand. Do you understand what you are talking about when you say you notify compensation event, you, you uh, notify an early warning, you instruct the contractor to submit quotation? So things like that. So number two, use the right verb. Use the right verb. The third one, the third one is also pretty obvious, but sometimes many people will overlook that. Which is what? Which is, you either do not quote a single clause, or you quote the irrelevant clauses. Quoting irrelevant clauses is quite common, but even more common is you haven't quoted a single clause at all. Now, when even when I work as a contract advisor, when I type up something, when I think I know something, I type up every statement in there, if I do not back myself up, if I do not verify that, then the other side, when they read, they will struggle to understand. Is that your opinion? Or is it really something in the contract? Can you convince me? If that is only your opinion, then if you can have, have an opinion, I can have my own, own opinion as well. And therefore, when you write something, you make sure you back yourself up. There is a difference between an opinion, even though we call it professional opinion, and a fact. A fact here, I mean, I mean, can you back yourself up by the contract? That is what I mean. So for every statement that you have made, you will try to justify yourself by going to the contract to see if it is really so. So that is the last point here. Now, how to quote the clause? Sometimes a clause can be quite long. You don't need to quote everything. You put them in, first of all, quotation mark. You put them in quotation mark, and then you highlight some of the keywords in there, and then put an irrelevant sentence or replace those irrelevant words by dot, dot, dot. You know what I mean? So you quote something, you want to highlight some keywords, then the irrelevant part, you skip that. How do you skip that? You put dot, 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 three dots in. And that is how, how we normally quote a certain clause. Obviously, you need to quote the con contract clause numbers. And that is one extreme. If you do not quote a single clause, you cannot justify your writing. On the other hand, you cannot quote the whole book. If you, if you put in the whole contract book in, for example, then obviously you have quoted the right clause. But it is as if you are saying to the other side that now these are all the clauses. It's all on the paper. Pick and choose. And that is not professional at all. That is not professional at all. So there is no there is no hard and fast rule on how many clauses should you quote, how deep an issue should you dig in. It simply is a judgment call. Sometimes we say, now, when you're faced with a certain contractual situation here, keep the main thing, the main thing. Keep the main issue, the main issue. Otherwise, I tell you what, the whole contract, many clauses, they are interlinked with each other. And therefore, if you go from one clause to another clause to another clause to another clause, potentially all the clauses, they are all linked up because it's, it's, a, it's a process called NEC. So if you go, go, go down the road, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, you will potentially quote the whole contract, uh, NEC contract book in there. Keep the main thing, the main thing, identify the issue. I've got another video talking about how to do some writings for NEC assessment some time ago now. Probably I need to redo that once again, do it better. Uh, uh, but if you look at that email, there are four, four principles. First one, you identify the issues. If you are interested, you can go and have a look at that, e uh, at, at, at that video. The second one is identify the rules. You carry out your analysis, then you draw a conclusion. Identify the issues. So keep the main issue, the main issue. All the side issues, 
if you have time or in terms of assessment, if you have the work count, then you write that. Otherwise, you answer the question directly. Don't shy away. Don't, 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 what is, what is that expression? Don't, don't, don't beat the bush. Don't beat the bush. So, so that is, that is, that is another common pitfall here. So these are the three things that we need to understand. What are they? Let me say that again. The first one, the first one, used the use of capitalized terms and italics, which means define term and identify term. Point two, point two, use the right verbs. You don't raise an early warning. You notify an early warning. Take, for example, when I talk about this, one of the delegate was a little bit surprised. And then he said, well, what's wrong with this? I said, it's very wrong. It's very wrong. So I, I just explained. The third one is you need to quote the right number of clauses down to the right level of details. It's an art. Sometimes it's an art. But there is also a structure to do an art. Keep the main thing the main thing. That's the, that's the first point. Now, I hope this video is useful for you. Uh, this is about assessment. I seldom talk about assessment online. Uh, I think it's more important to share with all of us here the, the contract itself. But I hope this is important for you. Yeah, this is useful for you. See you next time.